everybody else. Um, I am delighted to welcome everybody to this distinguished lecture of the Rucker Center for Gender, Sexuality, Law, and Policy. I'm Professor Suzanne Kim. I know um, most of the people in the room. And I founded this center now four and a half years ago, believe it or not. And we are absolutely delighted to welcome today Jillian Thomas, who's senior staff attorney with the American Civil Liberties Union's Women's Rights Project. And she's going to be talking in part about her incredible book, Because of Sex, One Law, Ten Cases, and 50 Years That Changed American Women's Lives at Work, published by St. Martin's Press in 2016. I wanted to take a moment to thank um, the Rutgers Law School, to, to thank our fearless, intrepid, and uh, always energetic uh, program coordinators, Tanya Bentley and Habiba Johnson. Um, thank you both so much for everything that you do um, for this and for everything else that you do at the law school. I want to also thank the Women's Rights Law Reporter for co-sponsoring our reception and our, our um, ongoing partners, the Women's Law Forum, particularly Erin Stidham, Kristen Scully, and Sam Milano for helping us with today's event in many, many, many ways. And I am very honored always to have the partnership of those organizations. So thank you so much. I am um, going to turn the mic over to our uh, fearless leader, uh, Codeine David Lopez, to actually do the formal introduction. So thank you. Just a little administrative matter. So we have this reception, and then Jillian actually has agreed to do a book signing. And a number of you actually got a free book already. Um, so feel free to bring that to have signed. Where If you have not gotten a free book, you can actually buy one from Barnes & Noble up on the third floor. And that's where the reception is going to be, as well as the book signing, right after this. Okay. So thanks. <coughs> Greetings. It's a real uh, pleasure to introduce Jillian Thomas. Jillian is someone I've known for quite some time. Um, we worked together at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, um, and that's where we first started to talk about like some of the deep issues of the statutes that we enforce. Um, I remember during the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, um, I went to the New York District Office, and. Um, talk to the uh, talk to the attorneys in the office about really how transformative that legislation has been and how it really grew off the sacrifice of the civil rights struggle. Um, one of the interesting things about the Civil Rights Act of 1964, in particular Title VII, is that it was developed really as an effort to eradicate the color line in the South. And there was a tremendous amount of uh, energy at the early EEOC to address issues of race discrimination. Uh, but what happened is that a third of the charges that came in dealt with sex discrimination. I know that Jillian's going to talk probably about the origination of the prohibition against sex in Title VII. There's been um, a lot of uh, debate about what prompted that, and I think it's actually an important debate. So I, I, I do believe you're going to talk about that, right? Um, and what happened is the EOC at the time was not prepared to deal with issues of sex discrimination. In fact, it issued um, guidance on sex restrictive advertising that really harkened back to the Mad Men era. They really gave sort of an imprimatur to sexually restrictive advertising. And it was so bad, it was so bad that one of the commissioners, um, Eileen Hernandez, uh, resigned in protest and she helped to uh, form the National Organization for Women. And if you look at the charter, and I would always tell this to our EOC attorneys, if you look at the charter of the National Organization for Women, um, part of the charter was that the EOC was not taking sex discrimination seriously. And it was really a demand. I would always tell the lawyers, it's like, we created the National Organization for Women because the EOC wasn't doing its job. Um, what happened after that was nothing short of a 360 degree transformation, the EOC, jumped in very aggressively um, in all areas of sex discrimination and really took the lead in areas such as pregnancy discrimination and, and uh, discrimination dealing with weight restrictions of flight attendants, um, gender stereotyping, um, sex harassment. Like, where did sex harassment come from? Do you ever wonder that? 
Um, and the EOC was part of this national conversation between the executive branch um, and Congress um, and the judiciary as to what does this language because of sex mean. And as part of that conversation, um, the prohibition against sex discrimination really has become probably the most transformative part of the statute. Um, and, I, and I know that's the subject of, of Jillian's book, and she'll talk about that today. Um, one thing I'm not sure if you're going to talk about is, is really uh, what's going on with respect to LGBT coverage and just how the because of sex has be, become the pivot um, for, um, for a real push for LGBT coverage. A push that started at the EOC when there were nine circuit courts that had ruled that sexual orientation isn't covered. So it was really in the finest tradition of the EOC that we were tilting at windmills, right? And we were pushing this issue, which we've seen now two in bond courts embrace and several, uh, and several lower courts. One thing I told my class, and, and I teach in a class on, on civil rights frontiers, one thing I told my class today, and I want, I want you to hear this, Jillian, because you'll appreciate it. When I interviewed here, I saw the sort of natural connection uh, between the EEOC and Rutgers. Um, and as Jillian will tell you, at the EOC, we always had budget freezes, there was always something going on, do we have enough staplers, do we have enough resources? There was always an issue of, of, uh, of resources. <clears throat> but the agency historically, and particularly in this space, has always fought outside of its weight class um, and, and has always pushed issues, pregnancy discrimination, um, LGBT coverage, sexual harassment, um, well before its time. And it's always been a leader. And I've always seen the parallels between this school, we affectionately known as the People's Electric Law School, um, which is always fighting outside of its weight class, which is always based on a lot of grit and a lot of pluck um, and is always like, you know, really duking it out at all levels um, as part of our Rutgers conspiracy. Um, and that is always sort of the thread that really ties it together. But anyway, I've talked too much. I will say Jillian Thomas is a great scholar. She's a great lawyer. We continue to practice together um, after we both left the EOC. Um, and a wonderful friend, and this book is absolutely amazing. Um, and the way she tells the stories, I remember talking to you about it when you were writing it, it's just wonderful because it really personalizes these cases that have been so transformative. So without further ado, my friend, Jillian Thomas. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. What a nice intro. Musical name cards here. Well, thank you so much for that, both of those generous introductions. Um, uh, thanks very much to um, Suzanne Kim, um, of course to Dean Lopez, my friend, longtime friend and colleague. Um, Tanya and um, Habiba have both been instrumental in getting me here today in one piece and getting my presentation together. So thanks so much to them and all of the um, staff at the, at the Center um, for Gender Sexual Sexuality, Law and Policy, as well as the Women's Law Forum members who are, are, uh, are co-sponsoring tonight's events. Um, so it's fitting to be here in Women's History Month, of course, um, but it also has a real special connection for me to be at, at Rutgers because, as many of you probably know, um, now Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, really made this ground zero uh, for the beginning of at least the constitutional revolution in the area of sex discrimination. Um, and if you haven't seen On the Basis of Sex yet, uh, which is totally unrelated to my book, and my book came first, thank you very much. Um, uh, and also the RBG documentary I urge you to because um, uh, Justice Ginsburg not only really changed the world for women um, under the law but also went on to co-found the Women's Rights Project at the ACLU where I now have the privilege of working. So um, thank you so much for, for having me. It's a privilege to be um, in this spot in this month, this Women's History Month. So what I'm going to do today is talk a bit about um, the current landscape for working women, um, some of the challenges that are out there. Uh, we've obviously just come off um, the, uh, the extraordinary first year of the Me Too movement. Um, so talk a little bit about kind of the present landscape and then from that point, 
um, turn to how we got here, how the law came to um, encompass sex, as Dean Lopez mentioned, and uh, who these women were who brought these cases forward. Because today, no matter what challenges we face, we at least have an architecture, a legal architecture, a vocabulary for tackling these problems. Um, but these women didn't, and that's what made them so extraordinary. And when I started the book project, I felt I wanted these women to be as famous as Anita Hill is. Um, I mean, her contribution was obviously um, completely historic and, um, and moved the needle in ways that no one could have imagined at the time. Um, but all of these other women did, too, in creating uh, legal precedent, which you know, the, the Hill-Thomas um, uh, hearings were a, a cultural moment, but not a legal moment. And the way these women helped create the landscape that we now all have the benefit of was, was, um, was my aim and really a, pri a privilege to get to, to tell. Um, <clears throat> so sexual harassment is obviously having a moment. It's on everyone's mind, and um, as well it should be. Um, I am also going to talk about two other uh, kind of major um, areas or, or aspects of women's identities that frequently collide with their um, work identities, their work responsibilities, and have been sort of the most fruitful areas for change with respect to sex discrimination and also continue to be the areas of the most friction. So harassment definitely is one. Also pregnancy and motherhood. And then finally, I'll use the kind of overarching um, uh, term of stereotypes. So this goes somewhat to what um, Dean Lopez was referring to with LGBT workers, but also the even the more fundamental um, struggle uh, that we continue to live with, certainly that was in effect in 1964 when Title VII took effect, which is this idea still that persists that there's such a thing as men's jobs and women's jobs, that there are certainly, even though we don't have ads anymore that say help wanted men or help wanted women, um, there still are, there still is a major schism in how we see what kinds of work we think women want to do or can do. Um, and of course that, that creates a lot of, a lot of obstacles. Um, I didn't mention equal pay, which of, of course is critically important to women's um, equality in the workplace. The reason I'm not touching on that, for one, is that it, it has not been an area where the Supreme Court really has um, pushed the boundaries that much in terms of the substance of the law and what, what pay discrimination looks like. But also, I would um, say to you that research really shows that all of the other factors I just mentioned, um, sexual harassment, pregnancy discrimination, and um, uh, uh, stereotyping, all are forces that create the pay gap that we live with, especially women of color. Um, so why don't I go through those in turn very briefly, and then we'll turn to the, the book, which um, the characters in the book are, are far more interesting than um, anything I have to say. Um, so where are we? We've had an explosive 18 months. It was October of 2017 when the news broke about Harvey um, uh, Weinstein, and one man after, famous man after another was toppling. I mean, you couldn't go on Twitter or turn on, you know, um, go on your Facebook page or whatever. I'm old. I look at Facebook um, uh, without seeing yet another bold face name toppling. And for those of us who practice in this area and know that roughly two percent of sexual harass harassment plaintiffs win their cases, to see this kind of accountability happening like on a daily basis, sometimes more than on a daily basis, was truly head spinning to watch. Um, what, what I've really taken away from the Me Too movement, and I think is the thing that's going to propel us forward, is the chorus of voices. I mean, that's what Me Too means. It's the chorus of voices from women and from men stepping forward, speaking their truth, um, making the world hear what has happened to them. It's what a lot of us knew, but, but it exposed a vast swath of the public and policymakers to stories that, that they didn't know existed. And I was especially heartened um, as an advocate that voices that we don't typically hear, the women who labor in the shadows so often but are especially vulnerable to harassment, so farm workers, um, the custodians who clean our buildings at night, 
um, uh, the people who deliver our food to our tables, um, housekeepers in hotels that, that you know, change the sheets where we sleep. Those women and their struggles, which are truly horrific, um, don't come at the hands of famous men most of the time. And um, it was truly extraordinary to see even news coverage of those women's stories as well. As well. And, and you, don't, you don't come back from that. Those stories are, have, have moved the needle in terms of public understanding of this, of this scourge. Um, but so where does that leave us? Uh, sexual harassment's been illegal for 30 years, more than 30 years. Um, so why does it still persist in these at these incredible rates and with such severity in certain in certain fields? And those of us who work in this area have had to grapple with the fact that yes, there are some gaps in the law that could be filled. Um, you know, for instance, Title VII only covers employers with 15 or more employees. So sure, we could pass some laws to close that gap. It doesn't cover independent contractors or interns, uh, people working in the gig economy. Yes, we need to cover more people. But that's about litigation fears driving employers' changes. Um, what I'm talking about is there's clearly a cultural problem that has yet to be upended despite the legal prohibition. And so um, what, what I as an advocate and folks I work with have, have tried to focus on is looking at what creates the power imbalances that allow harassment to flourish. Harassment is a symptom of other power imbalances. And so how do we, of course, we need to eradicate that particular behavior, but how do we get at the root cause? Um, so that makes me turn to one of the other po powerful forces forcing women out of the workforce, or at least stalling careers in many um, respects, and that's the pregnancy and motherhood issue. Women's capacity to become pregnant, become parents, and then the social reality, the cultural reality that women remain primary caregivers in our culture. Um, certainly not to the same extent that they were in years past, but, but overwhelmingly that's what studies tell us. And, um, and so um, those are forces that make women quit their jobs, lead to their being fired from their jobs, lead to their scaling back and not taking on more responsibility, by the way, things that drive the gender pay gap, um, and certainly drive uh, them to the middle or bottom of workplaces while um, men rise to the top. Again, that power imbalance gets reified. Um, and it's been 40 years since the Pregnancy Discrimination Act was enacted, and yet we're still left with that problem. I would say that that's the number one reason people call our office, is some, some variation on pregnancy discrimination. Um, a very common one, as you're probably aware, because it was in, at the Supreme Court a couple of years ago, a very common form of sexual harassment is women whose jobs are physically strenuous in some way, either because they work in law enforcement or firefighting, or they work in, <coughs> excuse me, in a low wage but physically demanding job like retail where they have to be on their feet all day or um, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier a hotel worker who has to be changing sheets and, and working with toxic chemicals so um, they uh, frequently need what are called accommodations or m temporary modifications of their job to keep working and it's astonishing even though there was a Supreme Court decision clarifying employers obligations um, in 2015 to provide such accommodations to the extent they're provided to other people who have similar temporary impairments. Bad employer decisions and bad court decisions approving them continue. And we're involved in three different appeals right now involving just such cases. And one's involving a certified nursing assistant, so heavy lifting by someone in a low wage job, an EMT, woman in a male dominated job, and a prison guard, another male dominated job. And all of them were denied accommodations even though the employer had a, a policy of assigning people temporarily to desk jobs and other kind of, kinds of light duty work uh, if they'd been hurt on the job. So that's another form of discrimination. And then w even once a child is born, of course, 13% of private sector workers have access to paid family leave. I mean, just a complete travesty in our culture. So then that's more lost wages, more time away from work, or you see women going back to work after um, astonishingly short leaves of just a few days or a few weeks, um, which certainly isn't good for anyone, but they do it out of fear of financial losses. 
Um, and then there's something called the maternal wall. Some of you may her have heard of that. Um, it's a term that was coined maybe 15 or 20 years ago by a professor out in California, Joan Williams. And it's the notion that, or it is used to describe the social science um, phenomenon we see that um, mothers are seen as less committed to their work, less dependable. Um, and uh, that, of course, affects how employers treat them in terms of giving responsibility um, or actually withdrawing responsibility. Um, and to the extent we don't have any structures in place to support parenting, like universal childcare or flexible work schedules on any sort of wide scale, that only contributes to sort of reifying the stereotype that, that parenting or mothering and work are not, um, not um, consistent with one another. And then finally, to conclude my, my opening remarks and then move to, move to the women's stories, um, the issue of stereotypes, the issue of um, how it's deep-seated in our culture to think that there are certain kinds of jobs that men do and certain kinds of jobs that women do. I just saw something on the internet the other day. I mean, you, you only have to look at Toys R Us, you know, to look at the way gender is still reified um, in what boys and girls are supposed to enjoy. Forget pink and blue. It's, you know, the trucks versus the dolls. But I saw some, there was something on Twitter the other day that showed two little kids from the back and the boy was in little brown, um, blue scrubs, you know, doctor scrubs, and on the back it said doctor, and the girl was in pink scrubs, and it said nurse. And someone had tweeted this and said, isn't this adorable? And it's just in this day and age to think that that's adorable as opposed to absolutely, you know, antithetical from the direction we want to be going is, is you know, you didn't need me to tell you that it's it's very, very deeply held that women do one kind of, kind of job and men do another. And that's the so sex-segregated workforce that uh, results of, or is a big driver of the pay gap. Women mostly are clustered in jobs held by other women. If you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, jobs held by women, the top jobs include secretary, teacher, receptionist, cashier, nurse, low-wage jobs held mostly by women. Men's jobs, um, most common jobs for men, are tend to be unionized, so truck drivers or laborers. Um, they tend to be highly compensated, like software developers. Um, and, or, uh, or Oh, the second most common uh, job for men to hold is manager. So they're in charge is basically the takeaway. So, um, and then finally, a, a really um, critical issue in, in um, sex stereotyping is what Dean Lopez referred to, the, the, the vast potential it holds for LGBT workers, although so far there has been mixed results, and that means, unfortunately, that we're, with this court, that we're shaping up for a circuit split um, that may well um, end up in front of this court sooner rather than later. Um, so... In closing, before turning to our to our stories of our intrepid women, um, I admit much of this is demoralizing, um, and I, believe me, I, I understand why it is. Um, but I will also tell you that I still hold out hope, still hold out hope for change, for improvement. And if I can do it, you can, because I work at the ACLU under Trump. Okay, I am depressed pretty much all of the time. But if I can see some glimmers of hope, you can too. And um, what keeps me feeling hopeful is these women, is knowing that um, speaking your truth, telling your stories, um, and not shutting up about it is what propels change. We have come so far in uh, the blink of an eye um, it's in the 50 so or so years since Title VII was enacted as part of the 64 Civil Rights Act. It was a mad men world. There were separate ads for men and for women um, that were totally legal. Stewardesses or flight attendants were fired when they gained a pound or got married or got pregnant. Um, sexual harassment didn't have a name until 1975 in my lifetime. Um, the, the court decision, which we'll be talking about in a minute, that created a cause of action for harassment was decided the year I graduated from high school. Um, this is all very, very new in historical terms. And so when I think about that progress that was made by pretty um, humble individuals or people who didn't have a lot of wherewithal besides a lot of passion um, for making change, I, I am reminded that progress is possible. And so um, 
again, my takeaway for you is um, on, on you know, where we go from here is the Me Too movement um, exploded because of storytelling. And um, it also exploded because people started listening. And everyone we encounter every single day from the, you know, the bus driver who gets us here to your, your professors to the people serving you lunch um, to the people who clean this building at night, every single person who works has a story to tell about one way or another in which the world of work isn't working. And so the imperative, I think, for us, those of us who are privileged enough to be in this room, privileged enough to be getting law degrees or have law degrees where we can make change, is to hear those stories, really listen to them, and then act. Um, so with that hopeful end, let's turn to some of our most powerful stories that we have. Um, as as um, Dean Lopez mentioned, and I won't dwell on this too long, but um, the 64 Civil Rights Act obviously was the culmination of the blood, sweat, and tears of the, um, of the uh, racial justice movement in this country. Um, but uh, at the very last minute, on the last day of floor debate in the House of Representatives, a, um, an elderly uh, a segregationist, ardent segregationist, virulent racist from Virginia, Howard Smith, stood up and announced, I want to make an amendment. And to the list of protected characteristics in Title VII of the 64 Civil Rights Act, all the different sections were called titles. So one was about public accommodations, one was about housing. Title VII was employment. He said, I want to add a, a characteristic that's protected. So it already was race, national origin, color, and religion. He said, I want to add sex. Well, this was received with a great deal of laughter. Um, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe. In the aftermath of Bull Connor sicking German shepherds on kids um, in Birmingham, maybe people were willing to admit that there was something had to be done for black people in this country. But the idea that women should have equal rights in the workplace was a joke. And, um, and so the debate went, on, debate went on for several minutes with people cracking jokes about this, about what a hilarious proposition this was. And then finally, Martha Griffiths, um, a congresswoman from, from Michigan, stood up and said, if there were any doubt about women's second-class status in this country, I think that laughter would have proved it. And then things got kind of quiet, and debate started in earnest. Now, as, as Dean Lopez noted, there's some... Uh, debate about what Howard Smith's motives were, because he obviously wanted the act to fail. And so some people think he intended to add gender so that, or add sex to the list of characteristics so that it would fail, so that people would vote against the law. Um, in my research and, and, and talking to people, I think the reality, including reading his own words, I think the reality is, it was more complicated which is Howard Smith actually was, a, was an ardent supporter of the Equal Rights Amendment, which had been um, in play since the early part of the 20th century. But the movement for the ERA was mostly led by white upper-class women. And um, the theory goes that these white upper-class women came to him and said, do you understand that if this law passes without a sex provision, that black women, by virtue of their race, are going to have more rights in the workplace than white women because there's no sex provision? And that didn't sit very well with Howard Smith. Um, and so um, that is the theory about why he offered it. And that's certainly what some advocates said. Martha Griffiths even said it. I don't think Martha Griffiths believed it. I think she wanted this to become law, and that's why she argued that way. But in any event, it was added. Um, it didn't face much of in the House. It didn't face much of a, a barrier in the Senate, and it passed through. And so then we were left with a law that all it said was, Employment discrimination because of sex shall be illegal. There hadn't been any committee hearings, hadn't been any testimony, written reports, why, why this law was needed. And so it was this real bare bones protection that no one really knew what they were supposed to do with it. Um, because again, it was a madman world. Um, and so, as Dean Lopez noted, for the first little while, the EEOC was not a place that was enforcing this provision of the statute very strongly. In fact, the very first head of the EEOC, um, FDR Jr., was asked at a press conference, you know this quote, right? He was asked at a pre press conference by someone, well, what about sex? And he said, don't get me started, I'm all for it. 
And then another head of the EEOC after him described the sex provision as a fluke that was conceived out of wedlock. So it was left to individual women to start coming forward and start using this law in court. So let's talk about the first of them. And when I say the first, I mean really the first, because her case was not only the first Supreme Court case um, uh, interpreting the sex provision, it was the very first Supreme Court case interpreting Title VII, full stop. Ida Phillips. So Ida Phillips in um, the 1960s was living in Orlando, Florida. She had seven children. She was married, but her husband was uh, a violent alcoholic and b basically drank his wages, and so she, she might as well have been a single parent. She was a waitress. She had an eighth grade education, and uh, she worked at the Donut Dinette. And a um, next-door neighbor told her that the, um, that the defense contractor, Martin Marietta, what in Orlando was going to be doing a big wave of hiring and the wages were twice what she was making plus they came with health benefits and a pension and all sorts of things that were going to make her life a lot better and the lives of her kids a lot better so she got in line went down to the plant got in line there was a long line of folks and she got to the very front of the line and she was asked do you have a child under five years old and she did she had a three-year-old named Grace at home and the secretary uh, giving out the application said, well, you can't apply then. And this was very confusing to Ida Phillips because she had, in fact, put together a child care plan and was going to be perfectly able to work with a small child at home. And um, the receptionist was unmoved and would not let her fill out an application. So Ida Phillips went home, and she sat down and wrote a letter to President Lyndon Johnson and I w was lucky enough to get to see this letter. It's in a glass case in the uh, Orlando Federal Courthouse. Um, and she wrote to him and said, um, I know you care about civil rights, and my civil rights are being violated here. I want to tell you about what's happening at Martin Marietta. Um, she sent it off. A couple of weeks later, she got a letter back from the White House telling her that her letter had been treated as a charge of discrimination and sent to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission for investigation. The EEOC did an investigation and found in her favor, having one rule for men and one rule for women didn't make any sense. I'm sorry, I may have buried the lead here. There was no prohibition on men with small children getting hired. Sorry, I should have made that uh, more express. Only women with small kids were deemed unqualified, not men, not fathers. So the EEOC found in her favor and tried to negotiate a settlement, tried to get the company to just hire her as they should have, um, but they refused. And so they told her, now you have the right to go to federal court on your own if you want to. Well, Ida Phillips, as, as I've conveyed, did not have a whole lot of resources. Um, so she, and she did manage to find one lawyer to go talk to, a white lawyer, and he told her, as she later told an interviewer, um, that, uh, that there wasn't nothing to it in her case. Um, he didn't see, see any reason to take it forward. And so instead of giving up, she thought, you know, in segregated 1960s Florida, um, who is likely to know how to bring a civil rights case? I'll bet a black lawyer would know how to do that. And so there was a black lawyer. By this time, she'd moved to Jacksonville, and there was a black lawyer running for judge in town. And she went to go see him and told her story. And he said, well, I'm too busy with the campaign. But I've got this young guy, Reese Marshall, who just joined me from the NAACP Legal Defense Fund in New York, and um, he might want to take a look at it. So Ida Phillips sat down with him, and I, I had the privilege of meeting Reese uh, Marshall, who still practices in Jacksonville. Um, he was the daughter of a single parent, a uh, single mother as, as well, and he felt a real kinship with Ms. Phillips. Um, but the thing that's so extraordinary in this story is how new Title VII was and how little the sex provision had been widely understood to even exist. He said that he, you know, took the interview with her, took the meeting with her, but then after she left her, his office, he had to go to the wall and pull out the statute and say, see for himself. And he said, yeah, there was. Sex is in there. Who knew? So he proceeded to bring a sex discrimination case under Title VII, but this was the problem that he faced in Ida Phillips' case. Martin Marietta hired lots of women. 70% of their workforce was women. It was just mothers of, and they even hired mothers, but it was mothers of small children that they didn't hire. And so they said, how can this be, how can we be guilty of sex discrimination? We have all these women working here. The trial court agreed with them. 
as did the Fifth Circuit. But what was important and what, what helped propel this case to the Supreme Court was that there was a dissenting voice at the Fifth Circuit um, who, uh, who the, and the, the judge wrote, he, he, um, he uh, gave the moniker to this theory that because you're only discriminating against some women, it's not sex discrimination. Um, he called this the sex plus theory. So in other words, he said, you take this you know, protected trait, sex, and then you add some other plus factor to it, in this case, motherhood of young children, and suddenly, poof, it's not sex discrimination anymore. And he said, think of the consequences of this. So you know, we hire black people, but only right-handed black people. We hire Jews, but only Jews who are five foot nine, and so on and so forth. And in his famous words, he said, if, if sex plus is the law, the statute is dead. It will lose all meaning if employers are able to slice and dice categories of protected workers and deem them off limits. That dissent caught the eye of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund in New York City. And they came on the case to write a, a petition for certiorari with the Supreme Court, which was granted, and then there was oral argument on the case in 1971. Sorry, 1970 was decided in 71. I think I'm right on that. Um, and during the oral argument, I will say, um, and, and I don't know if any of you feel like ever geeking out to this extent, but online you can hear the oral arguments from cases that are this old, from all the cases that have been argued before the Supreme Court, and I, I listened to it. And the, you can hear that the justices' brains are basically exploding while they're listening to this, because you have someone explaining to them a statute that they clearly did not know existed. And so you have people like Harry Blackman, who just a couple years after that, after this, this time, issued the Roe v. Wade decision, and he's a feminist you know, hero for that. You have Harry Blackman saying, so let me understand, under this law, that if a man goes to a hospital and tries to get hired as a nurse, that they have to hire him as a nurse? And the lawyer arguing for Ida Phillips, Bill Robinson, who's a professor at, at UDC, said, that's right, Justice Blackman. That's what it, it means to outlaw discrimination because of sex. And then Hugo Black said, well, what, what about ditch diggers? What if a woman goes and applies to be a ditch digger? Do they have to hire her as well, even if all the other ditch diggers are men? And Bill Robinson said, as long as she can do the job, it would be discrimination under this statute not to hire her. And then good old Chief Justice Warren Burger pipes up and says, um, this law doesn't apply to federal judges, does it? And it did not. So he was reassured of that. Um, but it, uh, there are other stories that, that were published at another time that I was able to cite in my book that he told his clerks, I will never hire a female law clerk, ever. They always have to leave early to go cook dinner for their husbands. They can't be relied upon. So this is who you have deciding your deciding the first Title VII sex discrimination case. One other one other gem from from uh, from Ju Chief Justice Ber uh, Berger. He was questioning the attorney from Martin Marietta um, about what kinds of jobs these were that that um, Ida Phillips had applied for, and he and the the lawyer explained that they were really small. Um, uh, electrical um, parts with, that involved a lot of um, digital work, you know, delicate finger work. And, uh, and, and Berger said, oh, yeah, no wonder 70% of your workers are women. That's why they're such good typists, too. You have the Chief Justice opining that uh, women are such good typists because they have such agile fingers. Um, well, the court came down with its decision quite quickly, and it was a unanimous decision in favor of Ida Phillips. Um, and what the court could see was, of course, what all of you could see, too. Having one rule for men and one rule for women is facially sex discrimination. Um, and so after that ruling, um, uh, there were a couple of important um, important developments in, in um, Ida Phillips' case specifically. Um, 
she entered settlement discussions with, with Martin Marietta, and unfortunately, the, the facts did show that, that in reality, all the people who got hired around the time that she wanted to get hired had been laid off fairly soon after. So she didn't have a lot in back pay losses. So she ended up getting around $15,000, which was pretty extraordinary <coughs> for her, but obviously not nearly um, what one would have hoped for. And she gave um, a third of the money to... Um, her oldest daughter, who's on the far right there, Peggy, to buy a new house or as a down payment on a house. She took Gracie, who's in there, the cause of all the problems. She took her to Disney World, and she bought herself an air conditioner for the first time of living in Florida. Um, the reason that this case is so significant is because it has helped us understand that there are lots of different there's a lot of diversity within these protected categories, right? <laughs> I mean, we're not, we're not all one size fits all. And so the idea of sex plus being a viable, oops, being a viable way of putting forward kind of multiple identities um, has proven very helpful. So for instance, if a, a claim is brought by an African-American woman who um, you know, gets questioned by a court because, well, wait a minute, white women are doing great in this environment. Black men are doing terrific, but being able to show that there are distinct biases and stereotypes and animus that apply to women at these intersections, that's very helpful to be able to say from Phillips v. Martin Marietta, just because it's not one or the other doesn't mean it's not discrimination. Um, so that is Ida Phillips' legacy to us all. Sadly, um, she remained a waitress the rest of her life, and the only reason I say sadly is because it means she never got the health insurance she needed, and she died quite young um, of cancer. Um, I was lucky because she died so long ago, I didn't get to talk to her, but I was lucky to get to talk to three of her kids who remembered the case and remembered that it really caused an awakening in her. She went to her first now march, um, and, and in general um, uh, was kind of a changed person by the experience. Okay, Ann Hopkins. So this is our, our story about uh, the law of stereotyping. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, before I go into that, just very quickly, last word on, I talked about motherhood. I, I, um, pregnancy, of course, is a, is a gigantic topic, and the Supreme Court has addressed it a number of times, and, and we'd be here forever if I were to talk about all the cases. But suffice it to say, a number of them are covered in the book, and it is clear that as a culture, let alone you know, male, the male-dominated judiciary, um, there has been a constant tension between thinking women because of pregnancy are too frail um, to work or in need of protection um, if they're going to continue working, to possibly the other way, thinking that they need special treatment, special protection, which um, obviously is a very freighted concept and, and is pretty retrograde if taken to its extreme. So, so there's a case in the book that was decided in 1991, again, very recently, um, about a battery factory that didn't want any women workers um, to have any contact with lead because it could harm their reproductive organs or, or a growing fetus even though those same, same dangers were in place for men. They stopped women from working in any job that had contact with lead, which of course had higher wages, um, and they, there was a blanket ban. The Supreme Court struck that down and said it's up to the individual woman and her family what risks she chooses to take. That's not for the employer to decide. Um, so anytime you see a woman working on an oil rig or as a you know, cop or firefighter, it's in part due to um, those women of Johnson Controls, the battery uh, manufacturer. And then on the other end of the spectrum is, of course, the bookend to that decision, the young case that I mentioned where you have someone who is doing a male job that involves some heavy lifting, and it is going to be dangerous to her developing pregnancy. And so she asks to be able to pull back from that work activity and in fact is told, no, we're not going to do that for you, that special treatment that you're asking for. Go home and collect, don't collect a paycheck until you've had your baby. So um, I mean, pregnancy discrimination is a, is a vast topic, but the court really shows a lot of conflict in how to deal with it. It has certainly not been resolved by the court. It's certainly not been resolved by employers. Um, so uh, back to Ann Hopkins. Um, 
So in the 1980s, Ann Hopkins was working at Price Waterhouse, um, which w at the time was one of the big eight accounting firms. And she had worked um, uh, in accounting firms for several years, uh, was a math major, had worked for NASA, a real hard driving, brilliant woman. And she came up for partner. And um, there were 88 people up for partner that year in 1982, 88 men, 87 men and one woman, Ann Hopkins. She had the biggest book of business. She had brought in the most clients, and her clients loved her. But she was told she didn't get promoted. And when she went to ask leadership why she wasn't promoted, this is the kind of thing she heard. No problem with how she dealt with her clients. No problem with the money that she brought in. It was that she was macho, that she um, used too much profanity for a lady partner that she needed a course at charm school, that she overcompensated for being a woman. She went to her mentor and said, who had helped a man who had put her forward and said, how am I supposed to do, how am I supposed to make partner? This is just who I am. There's nothing I can do to change this. And he said, oh yes, there is. He said, why don't you try to walk more femininely, talk more femininely, wear makeup, wear jewelry, and have your hair styled. So that was how she was going to make partner. Now, I got to meet Ann Hopkins, which was a great um, gift, and she actually died fairly recently. Um, so I feel very lucky to have met her. And she, as she described herself, she's a wash and wear kind of person. Um, she did, though, go so far as to buy a pink suit. And guess what? It didn't make any difference. Um, and she, in fact, the next year when she wanted to go up for partner, was told she didn't have the support of her um, department and she wasn't going to be put forward at all. And so that's when she quit and she got an attorney. Now Hopkins case is extraordinary because first of all she's one of the few women in the book of some means, you know, a, a quote unquote professional woman um, who brought one of these cases. Um, but what's really extraordinary is that she found a lawyer in Washington DC who was very creative and he knew from the civil rights movement involving black Americans, um, and specifically the Brown versus Board of Education decision, that social science had actually played a role in that decision, that it had been persuasive to the court, Supreme Court, to hear about the effect of, um, you know, the effect of segregation on kids, including the development of stereotypes about black kids um, that they started to hold themselves and that white kids held. And he thought, surely there must be research about this, about men and women, and how men and women act and look uh, and behave. And so he happened to f get hooked up with this young um, psychology student at Carnegie Mellon. Um, she's now at Princeton. Her name is um, Susan Fisk. And this was her area of expertise. And so he entered into evidence when, when Ann Hopkins' case went to trial, he entered into evidence an expert report from Susan Fisk. Um, now, he got very lucky, and this is, I think, another one of the themes that comes through in the book. You're, it's really luck of the draw what kind of judge you get. Um, some of these judges are open to, you know, to, to moving the needle forward, and some are not. And he was lucky to get a judge who was not only brilliant, um, but also the son of a child psychologist, um, Judge Gazelle on the D.C. District Court. And so Judge Gazelle got it. You know, he liked Susan Fisk, you could tell, said the lawyer who I got to meet. Um, and he liked her and he believed her. And what she said was she looked at the, the reviews of Ann Hopkins and she said, these, these reveal both proscriptive and prescriptive stereotypes. So proscriptive stereotypes, women are supposed to work, sorry, women are not supposed to look this way. Um, women are not supposed to swear or swagger um, or uh, use rough language um, or be um, impatient. But a prescriptive stereotype is women are supposed to be soft, they're, they're supposed to wear jewelry, they're supposed to style their hair. And in both ends of the spectrum, she was screwed. And so that was um, the, 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 um, largely the um, uh, basis on which the court found that she had experienced sex discrimination, that the decision to deny her um, partner was a discriminatory decision. It was appealed to the DC Circuit. The DC Circuit also found 
in her favor, and so it went up to the Supreme Court. Um, before I tell you about the outcome at the court, I just wanted to tell you a, a moment that really struck me as so um, very sad and, and um, poignant in all of this, which was um, it, it was part, Susan Fisk never met Ann Hopkins until the day of her trial because it wasn't her job to decide whether Ann Hopkins was nice or not nice or, you know, spiky, uh, temperamented or not. It was her job to decide, to, to give an opinion about what the, what the manager's decision-making had been like. Um, but they bumped into each other in the hallway of the courthouse after Susan Fisk had given her testimony. And Ann Hopkins, who admittedly had the it, women's movement of the 70s had passed her by. She hadn't ever taken note of being being a woman at, the, at work. She just had never identified that way. And she, um, she, to the day she went to trial, she kept calling it just a bad business decision. Why did they make this bad business decision? I would have been so good for them as a partner. She couldn't understand it. And then after Fisk testified, she told me that Ann Hopkins came up to her in the hallway afterwards and shook her hand and said, thank you. Now I understand what happened to me. And that strikes me as just such a sad moment when someone has sort of the scales fall from their eyes and realize, oh, this is a world in which my merit alone is not going to cut it. And that's a deeply sad moment um, to realize that. Before the Supreme Court, um, Hopkins won a unanimous ruling with respect to the sex stereotyping issue. It's a very messy decision with respect to a lot of other um, aspects that I, you're lucky I don't have to get into. But everyone was agreed, was, was on the same page, that to deny someone partnership because they are the wrong kind of woman is just as much a violation of Title VII and just as much sex discrimination as if they said, we don't promote women to partner full stop. And that was revolutionary. The idea that if you're punishing someone for not being the right, a woman in the right way, or a man in the right way, for that matter, and I'm using right, of course, in, in quotation marks, whatever your, your listeners deems that to be, uh, <clears throat> that that is discrimination. And so that's had enormous consequences in terms of the, stere the stereotyping doctrine has been found and recognized to be an indicator of discrimination in race cases, in disability case cases, age, the motherhood cases that, that have been out there, uh, pregnancy cases. Stereotyping is a viable form of sex discrimination and is the rubric under which LGBT employees have started to gain some traction. Because what's the ultimate stereotype, right? That men are supposed to be attracted to women and women are supposed to be attracted to men. Men are supposed to want to dress and identify as men. Women are supposed to dress and identify as women. And so slowly but surely, there is this progression under in a lot of the courts recently and the EEOC has very much led the way and I'm happy to say shows no signs of stopping despite um, the, the proclivities of our current government. And in fact, in one of the cases that David mentioned that was decided on banc in the Second Circuit in favor of sexual orientation being be se discrimination because of sex, the EEOC argued as a friend of the court at oral argument, and the Department of Justice showed up as a friend of the court arguing the other way. It was still Jeff Sessions, our Department of Justice at that time. So it was a really, surreal experience and the judges certainly weren't having it. Um, so as far as Ann Hopkins goes, so after an eight year litigation, she won at the Supreme Court. It actually went back down to the lower court for more wrangling, um, but she won and Judge Gazelle, um, for the first time she received um, the remedy of being made a partner in a law firm or in a, excuse me, being, being made a partner of any kind at the consulting firm. And she said she was very frightened to go in. I mean, you know, all of her peers were eight years on into their, into their partnership careers, but, um, but she did it and Judge Gazelle couldn't believe it. Like these are people who have spent millions of dollars to keep you out. What do you want, why do you want to do this? And she said, because I deserve it. I want to be a partner. So she went and she also very proudly told me that she became a huge advocate for inclusion efforts, a huge advocate for more diverse recruiting, more aggressive diverse recruiting. And she was able to tell me during our interview to rat rattle off all of the more junior 
consultants she had helped mentor up to partner status, and she was incredibly proud of that. And again, someone completely transformed by the experience of bringing a case like this. Okay, last but not least, Michelle Vinson. Um, and this is our section about sexual harassment. Um, Michelle Vinson is the only living plaintiff that I profiled in my book who would not talk to me despite numerous attempts. Um, so I was able to at least get her words from um, contemporaneous news articles as well as from um, three different attorneys she worked with, as well as from court documents and deposition transcripts. But I can understand why she didn't want to talk to me. It was an incredibly painful episode. Um, but um, you know, this is, this is the, the tale of someone talking about sexual harassment before there was really much of a vocabulary. I mean, you look at what happens today to women who are coming, for, and men, but, but mostly women who come forward and tell their stories, how they're pilloried. Why didn't you come forward earlier? You are, you are asking for it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this was the late 80s, or early 80s, folks. Um, so um, Michelle Vinson was uh, working at a bank in um, southeast DC, a really rough part of town, and she had a very, very um, underprivileged background, uh, not a lot of support at all from her parents, really much, pretty much on her own. Um, she had, in fact, intentionally gotten pregnant um, by an older family member or older uh, neighbor so that she could marry him and move out of the house. Um, she ended up losing the pregnancy. but. She, um, when she was 19, approached the manager of the, the branch, of, of the bank that was her, her branch where she had a checking account and she asked to be hired as a teller. Um, and the manager was a guy named Sidney Taylor, also African American and a real hero in the community. He had actually, so he was very active in the church and he also had started out as a janitor at the bank and had worked his way up. So he was really um, sort of a quasi celebrity and he took a real interest in Michelle and she gave her books on banking and um, lent her some money when she had to, when she left her husband and needed rent. Um, but within about six months, um, he took her out to dinner, which was not unusual. She'd been out to dinner with him and another coworker before. He took her out to dinner and he said to her as they finished their meal, um, Michelle, you're gonna have sex with me tonight. I made you and I can break you. And that's what you're gonna do. And she gave a lot of accounts of how um, uh, she basically responded to this by sort of going outside her body, um, which is not uncommon, of course. And she complied. Um, and she continued to be assaulted by Sidney Taylor for the next three and a half years. And, um, you know, there, you can ask all you want why she didn't tell somebody, but try to remember, or for those of you who weren't alive then, try to think. It's 1982, sexual harassment got its name in 1975. In 1980, the EEOC, awakened to its feminist cred, um, had put out a guidance on sexual harassment, decreeing it to be a form of sex discrimination. But at the time that this was all happening, courts were routinely dismissing sexual harassment cases brought under Title VII. They, they called it a purely personal problem. Um, and if there was, uh, you know, if, uh, if there were some conflict between a man and a woman around sexual stuff, that was, you know, that was personal. It was, as one court put it, an inharmonious personal relationship um, and not a federal case by any means. Um, now, slowly, 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 uh, courts started to recognize what's called quid pro quo harassment, meaning that if a, a boss said, sleep with me or you're fired, um, or sleep with me and uh, um, you're not gonna get that, or else you're not gonna get that raise, and the woman didn't comply and in fact was punished, courts did start to get, slowly but surely, that um, if, it, if you take a hit to your wallet, if your pay is cut, if you lose your job, okay, that looks like discrimination to us. We get that. But um, this thing that, um, that was happening to Michelle Vinson where she didn't lose her job, she in fact was promoted. And there's no question at all that it was because of um, the, the you know, sexual stuff that, that Sidney Taylor was, was subjecting her to had anything to do with it because in fact when they got to trial, Sidney, Tra Sidney Taylor denied that they'd ever had any sexual encounters. So she was moving up, becoming a 
uh, an assistant manager um, at the bank, and so she couldn't sh make that showing of harm to her bottom line, harm to her pocketbook that courts were saying she needed to have. Um, so that was the challenge in bringing her case, and her trial was an absolute disaster. Um, the judge allowed um, colleagues at the bank, um, some of whom were having affairs with, um, with Sidney Taylor themselves, to talk about what Michelle Vinson wore, how her blouses were too low, how her sh skirts and pants were too tight, how she talked about sexual fantasies. Um, and on the flip side, the judge refused to allow evidence in from women who had been harmed by um, Sidney Taylor's sexual aggression. So um, the, at, those, at that time, there weren't jury trials, just judge trials. So the judge found in the bank's favor. Um, she appealed to the DC Circuit. Um, the DC Circuit at that time was one of the most progressive in the country. Spotswood Robinson, an African-American judge who had been involved in the Brown v. Board of Education decision was on there. J. Skelly Wright, who came out of the Deep South and had had crosses burned on his lawn for all of his progressive civil rights opinions, he was on the court. And just a, a year or two before her case, Vincent's case got to them, they had issued the first decision on behalf of another African-American woman, um, Sandra Bundy, finding that a hostile work environment cause of action, in fact, um, could lie. And so um, Vincent won her case at the DC Circuit. I just always um, love to give these sort of little, um, all these famous people who are famous now sort of pop up during these stories in funny ways. And so one of them was um, after she won at the DC Circuit, the bank asked for an en banc rehearing. They asked for the whole DC Circuit to hear it and the request was denied. Three judges dissented from the opinion not to hear the case on banc. Do you know who they were? RBG. <laughs> no, 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 this is the DC circuit. Okay. She, wasn't, she wasn't on the circuit there then. Um, it was Antonin Scalia, Ken Starr, and Robert Bork. Um, yeah, so uh, narrow miss there. Um, so she went up to the Supreme Court and Yet another unanimous ruling. That's kind of extraordinary in this area um, of the law. Many of the cases in the book were decided unanimously. And although the court punted on the issue of how the actions um, of a harasser can be tied back to the employer for liability, they, they kicked that issue down the road for a future day. What they found was that um, having to, and they drew, by the way, very interestingly, drew on the already established law of harassment on the basis of race or national origin, and um, said having to run a gauntlet of abuse based on race um, is indistinguishable from having to run a gauntlet of abuse because of sex. And um, so they found that even in the absence of any sort of tangible harm, just this, in, this hostile environment itself was discriminatory. Um, sorry, one other, one other um, appearance by someone um, uh, who's now quite famous. At the time, you, re you remember I mentioned that in 1980, um, under the, the Carter administration, the EEOC had come out with a guidance saying that sex, sexual harassment was illegal, including hostile work environment harassment. Well, by the time Michelle Vinson's case came up to the Supreme Court in 1986, Clarence Thomas was running the EEOC. And Clarence Thomas didn't think much of a decision finding that hostile work environment harassment was sex discrimination, but his staffers, including his young staffer, Anita Hill, told him that it really would not be, um, it looked so good for a government agency to flip-flop, you know, having just put out six years earlier a guidance in this new area of the law to then rescind it. And so she was able to prevail upon him to split the baby. The EEOC submitted a friend of the court brief supporting the cause of action of hostile work environment, but saying that Vincent had failed to make one out, that the circumstances were not sufficient and they weren't, she also hadn't alleged enough facts to tie um, liability from Sidney Taylor up to the bank. Anyway, a unanimous ruling, obviously a, a complete history changer uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of women's work lives. There's another case in the book about further refining, the case that further refined the legal standard for, for harassment, which, which we don't have time for today. Um, 
but um, it, as for Michelle Vinson, um, she really got the short end of the stick, as far as I can tell. Um, she, her case got remanded back to the D.C. District Court for a trial under the proper legal standard. Um, and uh, it, it never made it to trial. There were so many motions that it got gummed up in, in procedural matters. And so the case finally settled uh, for an undisclosed amount. I do know, and I know from interviews that she gave, that she used at least part of the money to go to nursing school. And she does still have a nursing license in the D.C. area. But, um, but other than that, I, I don't know where she is or what she's, what she's doing. Um, but um, her pain was not for naught, that's for sure. Um, so uh, we have, thankfully, a, a, um, a vocabulary and, and legal standards that will, um, that are at least intended to help prevent her horrific situation from ever happening again. So I think I'll leave the discussion there and close um, and ask if I can answer any of your questions, whether about the book or about um, anything else that I've discussed. Yes, Professor Kim. Hello. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I felt like the way that you actually framed the introduction to the book in terms of tying it to today's events, um, I thought that was a really brilliant way to approach the issues because I do, I do think it actually shows a tremendous amount of progress, but also shows and helps to highlight some areas of really important and continuing need. One thing, I actually, I'm curious about a bunch of things, um, but on that subject, the times that in, in which these women lived or encountered this discrimination and decided to take up their individual causes were quite different. And when you did your interviews, did were you able to gather information about them on a personal level from themselves or from family members or friends that help to give more of a picture of how these incidents or how these experiences affected them on a day-to-day -day and personal level. And um, I, I think sometimes about the interviews and information about the Lovings, for example, right? And, and about the fact that Mildred Jeter had written this letter to Bobby Kennedy. And it was so, I mean, kind of similar to actually uh, what you were talking about. but. Um, she wrote this letter to Bobby Kennedy, and she wasn't, a, you know, she, she wasn't a very extroverted person. You know, she wasn't, she didn't really identify herself as an activist. But you know, what kind of pushed her to take that action? So similarly with the women that yeah. you you interviewed and researched about, were you able to see any kinds of trends in their? experiences, the impacts, the personalities, you know, what, what were the things that kind of tipped them over to make them actually take up their issues in this very public way and to seek redress when there really wasn't any reason for them to think that they would be successful at all? Right. No, that's a, that's a great question and that was definitely one reason I wanted to write the book is understand um, you know, I have clients and I see what brings them to my office, but I mean, they aren't trying to bring a case under the conditions that all of these women were. I mean, I think if I can, there are certain generalizations that I can draw. Obviously, everybody had, had different circumstances. First of all, something that um, was important was that two of the cases in the book actually were um, put forward by unions. So um, union organizers um, learning about these problems and moving forward for the membership. Now, one of them was sort of a little bit mercenary because it was uh, um, the, the Los Angeles County Department of Water had a rule because women on average tended to live longer than men, they made women give more out of every week's paycheck to go toward their pension plan. Um, or uh, than than the man the men sitting right beside them just because they were expected to have to draw on the pension longer even though you know the the, the guy next to them could have been running marathons and they could have been you know heavy smokers and the guy was going to live forever but um, so um, there was a it was the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers represented everybody at Los Angeles 
water and power company except the clerical staff. And of course the clerical staff was all women. And so they had a woman organizer who was like, how am I gonna get women to join the brotherhood unless we have something that grabs them? And she discovered this and she called the union's attorney who I got to meet, um, uh, Bob Dorman, and screamed at him on the phone, how could you let this rule be in place? You know, and so it was sort of mercenary that they wanted to encourage women to join the union by taking on this horrible fight um, against this rule that had been there you know, all along. Um, similarly, the women of Johnson Controls, it was union organizers who started hearing that women were being forced into custodian positions and other things that paid vastly less. Um, then you have, um, <clears throat> you have the women um, who uh, I think, um, you know, may not have been of means, but always had a real curiosity about the outside world, had a real feistiness. I mean, it shouldn't come as a surprise that, you know, there was a sort of backbone feeling and, and just a sort of visceral quality of like, that's not right. And I think you certainly saw that in Ida Phillips and her children confirmed that for me, that she was just spitting mad when she got back from that, you know, from trying to apply. There's a case I didn't get to talk to you about for, for time tonight, but it was one of the stories that actually really um, touched me the most when I started working on the case, um, which was a woman um, in Alabama named Kim Rawlinson who wanted to become a prison guard. Um, she was really interested in, um, she took a, 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 was a major in a, a topic called forensic psychology. And she was really interested in working with inmates and examining relationships between guards and inmates. Well, to be a guard in the Alabama prison system, you had to um, be 5'3 and 120 pounds. And she was, or you had to be 5'2 and 120 pounds. And she was 5'3, but 115 pounds. And so she couldn't even apply for the job. And so she was this wee little thing. And, and, um, and she said, and I said, why, why didn't you just eat a lot of ice cream or something to gain the extra five pounds? And she said, because that wasn't the point. It was totally arbitrary, and it pissed me off. And that was it. She was pissed because it was just a dumb rule. And to show you how dumb it was, her case originally was brought with a woman trying to become an Alabama state trooper. And an Alabama state trooper, you had to be 5'10", 160. Like, uh, <laughs> so... I mean, that it was clearly just like numbers that had been pulled out of a hat, and, and both she and the other woman, Brenda Meath, just said, this is stupid. This is what I want to do, and this dumb rule is stopping it. Um, and then you have, um, you have people who um, are really s surrounded by very supportive people, like um, Teresa Harris, who's the woman I, I mentioned, or I, did, I guess I didn't mention her case, but that's the other sexual harassment case that I was mentioning, who had a really strong support network, um, telling her that what had happened to her, she was harassed very badly, although not nearly um, the same caliber as, of harm as Michelle Vinson, but she had supportive kids and a husband and, and male friends even, who said, you gotta do something about this. So it's hard to draw common themes, um, but I would say that aside from um, uh, well, I wouldn't even say aside from, I, none of the women really saw themselves as feminists. I asked that question um, before they started um, this fight, and some of them still didn't. Like Peggy Young still wouldn't call herself a feminist, interestingly, even though she won that Supreme Court case. Um, so, you know, it, 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 there was no, no rhyme or reason. I, I'll just tell you really quickly the reason that Kim Rawlinson really st stuck with me, and I think this actually is maybe the most animating factor among all the women, is um, you know she grew up in Montgomery, Alabama in the 50s and 60s and was there for you know the bus boycott and the, you know the civil rights movement and it was a very very conservative family where the N word was thrown around. She was white, um, the N word was thrown around and the way she put it, uh, she was so quiet and reserved and stayed inside reading all the time. And she had two sisters. Neighbors were sometimes surprised to know there were three kids in the family because she never went outside. But she said she felt like an alien in her own family, like. Why are we talking, like, why did my family talk like this? Who dropped me off in this family, is what she said. And I think that's sort of that, that feeling of, like, 
something's not right and I need to, like when something, and she said the desire to be a prison guard had just clicked for her when she had done some ride-alongs with, with police officers. She said it ticked a box inside of me and I, I think that experience was, was pretty universal. People discovered this feeling of like, I'm mad and I don't want to let this go. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the for your time. It's uh, quite illuminating. Um, my question is more of a structural um, question with regards to what do we do with the prevail like the growing um, trend towards uh, binding arbitration agreements with employers or NDAs or um, <laughs> the fact that a lot of this is only coming into light because of reporters who yeah. uh, were able to gather enough. Um, trust with it with individuals who experience these things and um, what do we do about that other than I mean we don't really have a lot of leverage as far as like if you're signing a, a, a contract right so. right um, the question was about measures like arbitrary uh, arbitration clauses or, or non-disclosure agreements and other mechanisms that keep victims silent I mean I'll actually say I think the number one thing that keeps victims silent is fear of retaliation I mean, the statistics show that 75% of people who don't who claim to have experienced harassment never file any sort of formal complaint. So to me, that is the main source that we need to be getting at. It needs to be safe to tell your story. And in fact, studies also show, uh, this was in a report that the EEOC did that was really extraordinary a couple of years ago, 75% don't want to report because they think they'll experience retaliation. 75% of those who do report do, do experience some form of retaliation. So that to me is the ultimate silencer, just putting that out there. And that is more about that culture change that we talk about and you know, in, increasing penalties to hold an employer to account for, for retaliation. Um, but then the mechanisms you're talking about, I mean, I absolutely, there may be difference of opinion in this room, but I absolutely, um, and the ACLU absolutely is against um, arbitration, binding arbitration. The idea that with the, a signature, um, you know, you can you can sign away your your right to access the courts under our civil rights laws to me is just abhorrent. Um, they're totally employer friendly. They're paid for by the employer. There aren't rules of evidence. There aren't rules of civil procedure. Um, and actually, the, the statistics show they actually aren't less costly. Arbitration procedures aren't less cost costly than a trial. Um, so I, I'm definitely not for those. You know, the, the, the phrase NDA gets thrown around a lot and there's actually some, some apples and oranges issues going on. So there's an NDA non-disclosure agreement um, or non-disparagement, they're used interchangeably a lot, but um, that a lot of people have to sign at the outset of their employment. Um, that you're not gonna speak ill of the, of the company um, to other workers or outside the company. And now, typically we would think of that to be like protecting trade secrets and things like that, but many places, like the Weinstein Company, but many other places, use them to keep people silent vis-a-vis -vis their coworkers, vis-a-vis -vis going and talking to government agencies about what's happening to them, vis-a-vis -vis getting a lawyer or talking to their family members outside about what's happening to them at work. I'm absolutely against those as well, um, and the ACLU is against them. They, they arguably, violate um, the National Labor Relations Act, which pro prohibits any, um, you know, preventing people from concerted activity, and that's what we're talking about. We want people to be communicating and talking with one another, one another and connecting those dots. Then there's, um, uh, and so there has been legislation introduced to, to, to bar those kinds of agreements, and some states have passed it. Um, and then there's the issue of non-disclosure, non-disparagement agreements in settlements, and um, for those of you who are students, I mean, the way it, a settlement generally happens, you know, of course, you could file a lawsuit, which is public, and then it settles. But frequently what happens is that something rotten has happened to you or is happening to you at your job. You talk to a lawyer. The lawyer says, yeah, that sounds illegal. The employee says, I don't want to sue, though. I just want to get out of there and start my life over. So the employer will, excuse me, the lawyer will go to the employer and say, we think you violated the law. We're going to file a lawsuit unless we can reach a resolution here about a way to part ways. And then you get paid some so form of settlement, and the employer expects something back for that, right? 
And so what has become part of the culture of these settlements is saying, you can never talk to anybody about what happened here, about your allegations against us, that you've got money, okay? And so that is the kind of silencing culture that a lot of people are talking about, especially in environments like Weinstein, where there were these serial harassments, just serial settlements covering up the one big bad guy at the top. Um, the tricky part, and I'd be interested in hearing what either of you think about this, um, or maybe you don't want to opine, but um, the tricky part is I can tell you and all of my friends who are plaintiff's attorneys and have represented lots and lots and lots of people in sexual harassment lawsuits, a lot of them will tell you their clients want that too. You know, it's not a great thing to be Googleable that you brought a sexual harassment lawsuit against or threatened a sexual harassment lawsuit against your employer or that it's simply so traumatizing they never want to think about it again. And so they don't want their employer talking about it any more than they want to be talking about it. And so that's number one. I think some clients want them um, for their own you know, way of kind of closing a, a painful chapter and moving forward. The other thing that I worry about, if there's some sort of blanket ban on those kinds of provisions, is that it makes an incentive for the employer to say, well, fine, if you're not going to agree to confidentiality, then we're not settling. You're not getting any money. You can come sue us. In, in law, litigation, it's a horrible option. It takes forever. Your life is upended and taken apart and dissected, and you may never even win. And so I worry that if you take away the, the inducement for employers to settle, that you're going to have more victims left without any relief because they don't want to go to trial and they don't get the settlement. So, I'm sorry, that's such a long answer, but it's really complicated and it's, it's thinking about what's best for survivors in this, in this and it's, it's very individualized what's best for survivors. And so balancing that with the systemic problem of silence around this issue is, is very complicated. So the one thing I'll say is there has been some legislation proposed in the states that doesn't bar um, NDAs and settlements outright, but what they do is they require certain um, procedural protections, like you should discuss this with a lawyer before signing. You have 21 days after signing this to change your mind and listen. Um, signing this agreement does not mean, it does not in any way impede your ability to go to the EEOC or the New Jersey equivalent of the EEOC and tell them there's a lot of sexual harassment happening over there at my company. I can't get any money for it because I've signed a release of my claims, but you should go look into it. Lots of other people are having problems. Um, so informing people that the, the level of silence that they're paying, that they're um, agreeing to is actually not as absolute as they might think. Um, yeah, so th those, are, those are my feelings about it. But I mean, it, it, given my mantra of tell stories, tell stories, the idea that there are these ways that from getting truth out there is definitely a real hurdle. Hello, right over here. Oh, hi. hi. Thank you for your elaborate details and accounting for each of the case studies that you presented today. I was curious with Mr. Lacey and him being accused why the judge initially presiding did not allow for the accusers in previous ordeals with him to present evidence or why evidence was not accounted for? Oh, in the Vincent case? Yes. <clears throat> you know, when you get to trial and you have questions about what evidence comes in and what doesn't, um, the judge makes determinations about relevance and um, balances revel relevance, um, in other words, relevance to the dispute in question versus the unfair prejudicial effect that it might have. So. You can't deprive someone of presenting all prejudicial evidence. I mean, some evidence is bad for someone, but it's still relevant. Um, but what, what this was about was, was evidence that he deemed would be unfairly prejudicial um, to, um, you know, to, to uh, tar Mr. Um, Taylor with you know, these negative um, past acts that, he, that the judge deemed not relevant to what he did um, to Ms. Um, Vinson. Um, 
similarly, he deemed it relevant to her credibility and, um, and her welcoming, supposedly, um, the sexual advances um, of her boss by looking at her clothing, her um, demeanor, um, what she talked about with respect to sex. So it was they, that's a very simplified version, but it was that was basically it was deciding what was relevant to the fact finding about whether the whether the um, assaults had happened and whether they were consensual. Um, there are, have been changes in the evidentiary rules in the intervening years um, on both fronts. Um, so with respect to the the victim of harassment, just as in criminal law, there's been um, so you've heard of rape shield laws before. Um, it's, a, it's an expression, it's a shorthand, it's a way of saying that the um, victim's own demeanor, what she was wearing, um, the fact that she might be a sex worker, for instance, or the fact that she had um, you know, maybe had sexual relations with someone else the, the evening of the attack, or all the things that are brought out to make someone look less, you know, less of a good victim, less deserving of our sympathy. Um, those kinds of things are generally kept out. The, the woman is shielded from having those things come in. And it, it, that is also um, something that's used in the civil context. Um, and so uh, in a court today would be very hard pressed to, um, to let in evidence about someone's, um, someone's wardrobe. Similarly, on the Sidney Taylor other acts, there now, it now is acknowledged that other acts can be by the, by the same actor other prior bad acts can be brought in under certain circumstances, such as to show that he had a motive or such as to show a pattern or an MO. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so for instance, I mean, you know, the Harvey Weinstein thing, who knows what will ever come of that in a court of law, but just as an example, his MO was very much, it seemed, inviting these women to hotel rooms and then getting one way or another into a bathrobe and asking for a massage, like it was pretty much like clockwork. Those, those are the kinds of things that a court would likely allow in, um, in a case involving a, a situation where he did just that with this particular victim. Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for being here. I'm looking forward to reading your book. You. Um, so my question is, um, um, focuses on the intersectionality approach or, or perspective of because of sex and sex discrimination. I'm wondering about, does your book talk about cases in which there was both sex and race discrimination working? And then I also wonder through your research, as you talk to people who were part of the cases, did you see that sex, uh, that the sex discrimination was something that, that unified people and I, the reason why I ask that is because so I've been thinking about the 19th Amendment and it's, uh, we're celebrating soon its 100th year. And the story of the 19th Amendment was actually, it's it, not all women uh, pushed for it. And even those within the movement, there was a hierarchy. There was a racial hierarchy. So what um, did you see in your research with respect to the uh, cases in uh, with respect to women and sex discrimination? Those are, those are great questions. Um, the, there hasn't been a case before the Supreme Court that I'm aware of that has directly addressed the issue of intersectionality. I mean, as I said, the Phillips case with the sex plus, um, you know, sort of moniker, that has been used successfully in some cases involving um, race or national origin and gender. There's a case out of the Ninth Circuit, the Lamb decision, a woman who was a professor in Hawaii, if, I, if I'm correct, um, who brought a sex plus national origin. She was Asian American. Um, and then there was another case, um, the Jeffries case, Fifth Circuit, I think, um, African American woman bringing um, an intersectional claim. The, the term intersectionality is sort of a cultural term that we're all starting to um, uh, recognize. It has not penetrated as much in the legal doctrine, so you're going to hear more often sex plus um, or race plus or age plus. So um, I, I, had a, I had a client once who was an older African-American woman at a, at a, a TV station. She was an anchor, and we got all the, the um, 
salary information and we plotted it on a graph and it was like, you know, old white men were up here, like younger white men here, men of color here, older men of color down here, and it went down, down until you had older African-American woman, like down at the very bottom. Um, so those, those prejudices are realities that, that we try as advocates to make courts understand. That's sometimes why it's helpful to have an expert. Um, courts allow you to have experts on different topics um, where it's gonna aid the fact finder in understanding. And so helping um, judges and juries understand that um, people live at the intersections of lots of identities um, and that discrimination comes in myriad shapes and forms. Um, so, to, so to answer your question, the, there aren't any cases in the book that directly presented that issue. There are certainly um, plaintiffs of color in the book, um, but, um, but they didn't bring the, I mean, their personal circumstances certainly reflected lives uh, at the intersections, but in terms of the legal issues that came up in the case, not so much. Um, and I'm sorry, the second question was about, um, oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, we could we can spend a whole another few hours talking about how rotten women can be to other women, um, and uh, it's actually a a, a myth um, that I, th I think a lot of trial I think a lot of trial attorneys would say it's a myth that, for instance, if you're going to have a sexual harassment case, that you want women on that jury, um, because women like to see themselves people, but um, women like to see themselves as well, I would never be in that position. If that happened to me, I'd tell him to stop. If that happened to me, I would you know, quit or turn him in. And um, people perceive in themselves a lot more um, resources than they may have when they're in a real situation that's messy you know, with someone who has power over you or someone you like, God forbid, um, doing something like that. Um, so I, I hope I'm answering your question by saying that I, um, I didn't get to talk to any of the women who, who testified against Michelle Vinson. I think a number of them were having their own relationships with him and still worked at the bank and you know so needed to keep their jobs and he was taking good care of them so it was in their interest. Um, I can't get in their heads. Um, but then um, I think also a lot of the women I, who I spoke with, as I said, not many of them I d identified as a feminist when they started. I think there were just two of them who t said that they really saw themselves that way. Um, but over the course of the decision of the case, and as it dragged on and on and on, that they um, that they started to see what was happening to them as something bigger in the world. Um, I, and I'm you know I'm thinking of the Ann Hopkins moment. You know this woman who um, had been you know. Uh, succeeding very much in a man's world, realizing, yeah, she's just a woman after all. That's how they see her, she's just a woman. Um, but it can, it's incredibly empowering though too, I have to say, I mean, I have a client now who's a retail worker, um, you know, a minimum wage worker, and um, when we first met and, sh and we were talking and I, I told her I thought she had a case of pregnancy discrimination because of what had happened to her, she, um, you know, no college education, um, not into current events, or you know, had had never heard of what the Family Medical Leave Act was, or the, you know, any of the anti-discrimination laws. Knew nothing. She didn't know pregnancy discrimination was illegal. She didn't know anything, and she was a very timid person. Um, her home life had been such that she um, just, you know, was never really taught to be s secure in her own skin. You know, here we are, two years later. And she wants to talk any chance she gets about this in her family, on media, on, you know, she, it, it has transformed the way she sees the world. And um, it's really extraordinary to watch someone kind of experience adversity, be, be laid low by it, like I can't believe this is happening, feeling the betrayal of an employer, you know, doing this to you. 
and then realizing there's something you can do about it, that's incredibly, and, and that someone is willing to help you. Um, uh, you know, I think, I think is a very empowering experience in, in total. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Oh, yes. good. I'm so glad you felt that way. Good. I loved it. Good. 